Okay guys, today's topic is about acute upper GI hemorrhage. This is a very serious condition and it's an emergency. Um, if you do encounter a patient in the ward or anyone um, presenting with symptoms of acute upper GI hemorrhage, um, please do get senior help as uh, these situations can get out of hand pretty quickly. So we're just going to start with the definition of acute upper GI hemorrhage. So, Acute means abrupt onset, it's quite rapid, upper GI, and um, this starts from the esophagus all the way to the duodenum. And hemorrhage, which is a leakage of blood from a vessel. So we're just going to go into a bit of epidemiology. So upper GI hemorrhage is an emergency. Um, as I have said, and presents with a mortality of 6% to 13%. These upper GI bleeds are also far more common than lower GI bleeds. Incidence in the UK ranges between 84 to 172 per 100,000 per year. It causes a vast amount of hospital admissions per year. What are the causes of upper GI bleeds? Well, most common cause is bleeding from a peptic ulcer. Now, there are several different ways that one can get a peptic ulcer, which include uh, long-term steroid use and antiplatelet, antiplatelet and anticoagulant agents or H. pylori infection. Um, secondly, the second most common cause are variceal hemorrhages, which come about due to increases in portal hypertension. Most commonly, uh, esophageal varices are involved. 80% of the time these are esophageal varices, but other varices can also cause an upper GI bleed. Okay, here are other causes of um, upper GI bleeds, the less common, gastric ulcers, have du duodenal ulcers, um, esophageal or gastric malignancy, mammary weiss tear, um, dulafoil lesion. This is a um, large arterial found in the stomach wall which is prone to leaking uh, blood. Okay, signs and symptoms in upper GI hemorrhage. Why are we looking for? Well, hematemesis, uh, um, melina. These are all um, symptoms of uh, blood loss. Coffee ground vomit. And the other symptoms include lightheadedness, dizziness, all symptoms of blood loss, and postural hypertension may also be present. Um, patients may um, present with epigastric pain or diffuse abdominal pain. Those are the general signs. Now, risk stratif stratification. So we have a patient coming in with a GI bleed. How do we know what? Uh, how can we assess what to do with that patient? Well, there are several scores that are used in the UK, and these include the Glasgow Blatchford score and the Rockwell score. I'm going to go into detail with the Rockwell score, and um, um, I mean the Glasgow Blatchford score, sorry, and um, just going into a bit more detail with it. Um, so it takes into account all of these uh, criteria, especially uh, hepatic disease, as this would obviously affect uh, the varices and also cardiac failure. <coughs> Here is the Glasgow Blatchford score, and the uh, score is um, represented on the right hand side. So um, with the Glasgow Blatchford score, it ranges from 0 to 23. A patient can be discharged and considered low risk if there is a zero score. Uh, any score above this needs intervention, which can be transfusion, endoscopy, or surgical intervention. Um, again, with um, these scores, they are only a guidance. A complete clinical picture must be taken into account. Um, they are just a guidance. Please remember that. Uh, the score should not be used in pediatric patients or other patients with small bowel small bowel or lower GI bleeding management so this is a step-by-step -step management of what to do when a patient presents with upper uh, GI bleed or well, you take a history noting down the um, past medical history notably such as co notably comorbidities such as liver disease as this will influence uh, management 
we must take bloods very important it gives us a good idea of what's going on it includes uh, hemoglobin urine electrolytes lfts um, serum urea and nitrogen creatinine ratio of more than 30 mg will also tell us that there is a likelihood of upper gi hemorrhage and we must give oxygen to the patient and stop any NSAIDs. However, um, if the patient is on anticoagulant or antiplatelet drugs and antiplatelet drugs um, due to a cardiac incident, uh, you must see cardiology referral as taking them off these um, could put them in considerable risk. So, um, carrying on with our management, pulse and blood pressure should be checked every 30 minutes. Um, compromise hemodynamically signs includes tachycardia and BP um, dropping. We need IV access, especially for transfusion. So we use two large bore cannulas, the grey cannulas, the large ones, and give 0.9 saline if you're still waiting for a transfusion. Okay, so if there are indications for transfusion, you must transfuse, such as shock or hemoglobin below 10 grams per deciliter. Um, patients with heart failure, please do note and keep an eye out for fluid overload. You, um, it can be just as bad as under, um, under perfusing them. Platelet transfusion should be given with, um, to patients to um, prevent any exacerbation, any extended breathe, um, bleeding. Um, so with the scoring systems and the history taken and collectively everything that has come together, you can then um, decide with approval from a registrar or a consultant um, if this patient needs a urgent endoscopy um, referral. So the treatment essentially is to um, go in with endoscopy, identify what type of bleed it is and then um, seal that bleed by either um, cauterizing it, tying it off or embolizing it. There are several different ways and if this um, persists we can do several other um, um, several other actions can be taken to make sure it does not um, continue to bleed. So um, if by endoscopy we see that the hemorrhage is very severe, um, which um, um, if it is very severe, we will treat treat it with this algorithm. So they are treated mostly esophageal varices are treated mostly by endoscopic band ligation. Gastric varices, on the other hand, use a glue or thrombin. After the endoscopy is done, a patient should be given prophylactic antibiotics. Um, such as Fergen cephalosporins and terlipressin should be continued for 72 hours. Terlipressin is a potent vasoconstrictor and it will reduce bleeding by constricting um, spongic uh, vessels. Continuing with variceal management, if bleeding does not stop, we would consider a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. It's quite a mouthful, um, tips for short. So what this exactly does, it places a stent between the portal vein and the hepatic vein and um, the idea is this reduces the portal venous pressure gradient thereby re reducing bleeding from the varices. Think of it as if you're squeezing a, um, a saline bag for example, you're squeezing a saline bag and pressure goes up in that bag. Um, you stop squeezing it, pressure goes down. Um, this um, procedure is um, sort of follows this um, analogy. Risks involve uremic encephalopathy because there is a risk of the blood not being filtered. 25% uh, of patients suffer from ure uremic encephalopathy post-surgery, but this can be managed quite effectively. Okay, so here is an image showing um, how a tips. Um, is how a TIPS procedure is carried out and where the blood flows reducing um, the pressure. Moving on to management of non vericeal bleeding. What is non vericeal bleeding? Well, um, um, non vericeal bleeding um, is due to um, stomach ulcer uh, leakage. Uh, stomach ulcer rupture. So if the endoscopy finds non-variceal bleeding, 
we need to check how bad the lesion, uh, lesion is. If it's low risk, we usually just give the patient uh, oral PPI and address the um, cause, such as a high H. pylori infection or prolonged NSAID use or um, other drugs. And we can usually discharge the patient if it's not too serious. High risk lesions, on the other hand, are a different story. Um, these are determined by the endoscopy and should be treated with dual endotherapy. This is a combination use of adrenaline, which vasoconstricts the site, and combined with a uh, mechanical method, such as a heater prop to seal off the bleeding. And um, once we carry out uh, this procedure for high, um, sorry about this, uh, once we carry out the procedure for high risk lesions, um, we usually prescribe the patient um, IV PPI for at least 72 hours. Okay, so continuing with non reversible bleeding, if the bleeding does persist, then um, we, we, after all these procedures, if the bleeding does persist, then um, mesenteric angiography and embolization of the source should be considered. This is usually done by a interventional radiologist. And that is a summary of uh, GIBs. If you have uh, acute upper GIBs, if you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section. Thank you very much.